What's up, Rise Church family? It is so good to be with you guys together this morning. I know we're not together in person, but thank you, God, for the power of technology where we can do stuff like this. Pastor Rebecca and I miss you so much, and we cannot wait to be back in the house next Sunday, so make sure you're here. We can't wait to see you, hug you, and just be back together with you again. If you're here for the very first time, my name is Adam, and together with my wife, Rebecca, we lead in Pastor Raj Church, and man, we're honored to have you in the house. We call you new here, around here, because you're brand new to our church, and come on, thank you so much for being our guest. I hope you already feel loved and welcome in this place, and it's our heart's desire that you leave here encouraged and strengthened in your faith today. Do us a huge favor. Grab that blue New Here card in the seat in front of you or the one you're sitting in right now, and you can fill it out at some point during the experience, and then when you exit out today, stop by one of our New Here tents. Some of our people are going to be there to meet you, greet you. Thank you for being with us today. Put a small gift in your hand. We are so honored that you're here. If you're back for the second or a third time, come on, we're so glad that you're back as well. Why don't you stop by that same new here tent? You're gonna get a different gift just for us to say thanks for being back with us and the gifts keep getting better. Well, come on, today we are continuing our summer series that we are simply calling Promises, Promises. And for the past few weeks, we have been looking at some amazing promises of God, and I am excited to continue in that today. Come on, how many of you know the promises of God are true, they're faithful, and they are for us, and the Bible is loaded with them? Our theme verse for this series is Psalm 145, verse 13. Come on, do me a favor and go ahead and stand up on your feet as we honor God's word. I'm not in-house, but I told my staff to make sure y'all were standing. If you're standing, say yeah. I'm just believing you're saying yeah. Come on, here we go. The Lord always, somebody say always. He always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. Come on, take a seat. Today, I want to preach on this topic, the love of God. Come on, if I could preach any sermon at any time, if you said, man, you got one sermon left, Pastor Adam, what are you going to preach on? Man, I am going to preach on the love of God. It's the love of God that changed my life. It's the love of God that probably changed your life. And if you're here today and the love of God has never changed your life, today could be the greatest day of your life. So back in the day, there was this theologian, this professor, this preacher um, of God's word. His name was Karl Barth. And he was giving this lecture at a university. And one of the students asked a question. They said, Professor Barth, if you could sum up like everything you've done in your life, if you could sum up all of your life's work, what would you say? And he said this statement, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I don't know if that's where the children's song originated. Maybe it did, or maybe he stole that line. I'm not sure. I didn't do enough research, but I love that. This man, this theologian, this great professor said, if you could sum up my life and everything I've done, this is it right here, that Jesus loves me. And I know it because the Bible tells me so. Come on, let's take a look at the most famous verse in all of scripture, John 3, 16, For God, come on somebody, he didn't just love the world, he so loved the world. He didn't just love you, he so loved you that he gave, come on, his one and only son. He gave us Jesus, thank you God, that whoever puts their faith and believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Come on, this is the love of God, and there is nothing like it. And he loved us so much that he sent us Jesus. But now we gotta back up just a little bit and go, why did Jesus come? Maybe you're brand new to this whole church thing and Jesus thing. You're like, well, why did he send his son? What's what's the reality? Let's read a couple more verses. This is in Romans chapter five, and it says this. When we were utterly helpless, like we weren't just bad off, we weren't just kind of struggling. No, we were utterly helpless. We were a mess. Christ came. Jesus came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Go ahead and raise your hand if you would die for the person sitting beside you. Anybody? No, no, no. I'm not dying for any of y'all. Maybe my wife, probably my wife, probably my kids. I would do that, but I don't know about the rest of you. 
But then it goes on to say, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is maybe especially good. So maybe if like you got a really good friend that you really care about, maybe you would jump in front of a bullet for them. Maybe you would die for them. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when? Not when we were good, while we were still sinners. I wrote these two thoughts down, that while we were sinning, come on somebody, God was working. While we were sinning, here it is, God's plan was in motion. And so we're living a sinful, rebellious life, not following after God. God looks down and goes, they are in trouble. Their sin is gonna keep them from having a relationship with me. And he sends his son, Jesus. Jesus steps down from heaven and says, I will give my life for them. I will die a perfect life for their mess so that they can be made right with me so that they can have a relationship with God. So we've established that God loves us enough that he sent us Jesus. Now we've established that that Jesus came and the reason that he came was to die for our sins. And once we received his love and said yes to a relationship with him, here's the good news that happens for all of us. 1 John 3, 1. Behold. Now that's a word we don't use very often, is it? When's the last time you just walked into a room and you were like, behold, I would challenge you, if you got something good, you need, to, you need to rock a behold every once in a while. And John's saying right here, hey guys, you need to check this out. Like what I'm about to say is a pretty big deal. Behold, what great love the Father hasn't just given us, he has lavished it on us. He has, he's poured it out on us that we should be called, here it is, children of God. And that is what we are. So Jesus loves us. God loves us that he sent us his son. Jesus died for us while we were sinners. And because we've received his love, now we get to walk around, not anything special about ourselves, but because of what he's done for us, we get to proclaim, man, I'm God's son. You're God's daughter. Like we're children of God. That's amazing. It's amazing. And so now we know that God loves us. Now I wanna look at the promise this morning of this great love. And here's the promise, that nothing, come on, somebody say nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I wanna look at some verses this morning in Romans chapter eight, and we're gonna work through a few of them. So if you're with me, say yeah, Come on, lean in, let's go. Romans chapter eight, starting in verse 31, says this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? And you're gonna need to go read the verses before that to find out what these wonderful things are, but I promise you, they're wonderful. If God is for us, come on somebody, who can ever be against us? Now this isn't the promise for today, but this is a promise in itself. That if God's for you, there is no one that can ever try to come against you. There's not a person that can stand against the God who is in you and for you. The devil himself cannot come against the God who is in you and for you. The devil's looking around going, what happened? I had him here. Then they said yes to Jesus. Now they're gone. I got nothing. Uh, He's trying to fight Jesus. He already lost that battle. Now he can't come against you because Jesus is in you. Come on somebody can I get a better amen and then Paul goes on to say this in Romans since he did not this is God he didn't spare even his own son that's what we read earlier in John 3 16 but he gave him up for us all and then he says these words won't he also give us won't won't he give us everything else so so if 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 he gave us Jesus for our eternal life won't he take care of us in everything else? And the answer is, yeah. Paul's kind of asking a question that we already all know the answer to. Of course, God's going to take care of us. He's a, he's a good father who, come on somebody, loves us. Now, the following verses, Brother Paul, who's again writing to a church, he's about to sound like, he's about to sound kind of like an owl, all right? So, so check these out. I call these the owl verses. 
Come on, somebody. Who? <laughs> that was pretty good. Who? Who then is the one who condemns us? And then he answers the question. He doesn't, he, he doesn't even wait for you to answer. He answers it for you. Like no one. Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So picture this. Jesus came, he died, he rose again, and when he went back to heaven, he didn't just kick his feet back and go, I did it. No, he's at the right hand of God and he's interceding for us. Like he is talking to God on our behalf. Come on, let that sink in for just a a minute. How amazing. What a wonderful Savior who not only gave us life for us, but now is talking to God on our behalf. And Paul's saying, who's going to accuse you of all the things that you've messed up? Who's going to accuse you of this? No one, because Jesus already paid the penalty for it. Now, the Bible calls the devil the great accuser. And I want you to look at these verses in Revelation where it talks about the devil. And this is this is the John the Revelator. He's getting a picture of heaven and he's seeing some things and he's hearing some things. And he says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Messiah. He's talking about Jesus. And then here's the verse I want us to land on. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, that's the devil, who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. The accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night, meaning just like Jesus is interceding for us at the right hand of God, the devil is also, and I don't know how this works in heaven, but the devil is also trying to accuse us day and night. And I think that's why Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. And he's going, don't listen to those accusations. I already paid the debt of their sin. Don't listen to the lies that he's trying to say about my people. I love them. I gave my life for them and they put their faith in me. God, you know them. And come on, somebody, then he gets, he gets hurled down. God's like, I'm tired of listening to you. I'm tired of your lies. I'm tired of your accusations. I'm listening to my son. Get out of my presence. Come on, that's amazing. Come on, let's read on in Romans where it says this in the following verses, Romans 8. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? And that's the question. Can anything separate us? And I don't know about you, maybe you've had a moment in your life where you felt like you did something that did separate you from the love of God. Maybe you felt like something happened and as a result of that thing that happened in your life, you look on and go, God, where are you? And God, why would you let this happen? And God, do you even love me? And Paul's about to kind of answer that. He says, does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Now, these early believers, man, they went through some stuff, a lot more than what we go through. But what Paul's trying to establish here is this. Hey, does it mean that God doesn't love us just because we have hard times in life? Does it mean that God doesn't love us just because we go through something difficult? It might appear that God doesn't love us because if he loved us, why, why, why would a good God let bad things happen to us? I don't know that answer. But does it mean that he stopped loving us? Does it mean that we're separated from his love just because we're walking through something difficult in life? Absolutely not. Because nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Come on, I'm getting fired up right now. I love this next verse. No, he says, like he answers it right there. No, we should have put that in bold letters. No, despite all these things, here it is, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ. Here it is again. Who loved us? I don't know if you've ever taken your kids somewhere. Maybe you took them to an amusement park. Maybe you took them to the zoo or maybe honestly even just walking around the grocery store. But if they're little, 
odds are at a certain point, that little kid looked at you and said, I'm tired. I don't want to walk anymore. And they said, can you carry me? Can you carry me? And now we've done enough amusement parks when our kids were younger. And man, I have carried my fair share of kids around till my arm is about to fall off. And every once in a while, I'll say, jump on my back. I'll give you a piggyback. Now, we turned it into something a little more fun in our house. We called it big dragon mode. It's big dragon mode. Get on my shoulders. Let's go. But even big dragon mode, man, I would get tired every once in a while. But here was the reality for my kids. They're not doing anything. They're not exerting any energy. They're just hanging on. And dad is taking them everywhere they need to go. No power, no strength on their own. Just dad doing all the work. That's what Paul is saying right here. Hey, nothing can separate you from the love of God because overwhelming victory is ours, meaning we just get to jump on the back of our Savior who has already done all the work, the finished work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, everything is his. And he's saying, I will carry you every step of the way and nothing, no, nothing can separate you from my love because I am with you, I am for you, no one can come against you, Whoo, that's good stuff this morning. Let's go, church. And so then Paul continues on and he says these words, and I am convinced. And I want to stop there. And I highlighted that word convinced because if anybody would have thought that maybe the love of God wasn't for them, it was Paul. Because before Paul was a follower of Jesus, many of you know what his life was. And he was actually a murderer of Christians. Like he went around finding Christians, throwing them in jail, even killing some of them. And so Paul then gets transformed by Jesus, goes on to become a preacher of this thing that he was trying to kill. And I'm sure there was moments where Paul could hear the screams of the people and he saw the faces of the people that he had thrown in jail or even had took the lives of. And in those moments, I'm sure Paul was thinking, why would God ever love me? How could God ever love me? And maybe that's where you've been in your life before. Maybe you're there right now. You've messed up recently. You keep doing the same thing over and over. You keep struggling, keep falling back into that same sin pattern. And you start thinking to yourself, man, like surely God's love is gonna run out on me at some point. And I'm just here to tell you from Brother Paul, whose sins probably far outweighed yours, nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Now, here's what I will say. You and I can live our lives in a way where we're not pursuing Jesus on a daily basis. And in those moments, we might live where we're not necessarily receiving God's love. We're not feeling God's love. We're not walking in God's love. So it might feel like we're separated. But the matter of fact is, if you are a true believer who has put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you have surrendered your life to him, there is nothing. Hear me on this, nothing that can separate you. Now, don't fool yourself and go, yeah, I think I'm a Christian. Have you put your true faith in Jesus? Because if that's the case, then nothing can separate you. But if you have never surrendered to him fully, then maybe you don't have the relationship you think you have, and maybe today is your day. But if you are a follower of Jesus, come on, take it to the bank. This is a promise that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then he goes on to say this, just in case you were wondering, maybe there is something. He gives this exhausted list of things that cannot separate you. Death can't and life can't. Angels can't and demons can't. Neither our fears for today nor our worries about 
tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Meaning this, hey, if you're living, come on, you're living in God's love. If you die, I know death is painful and hurtful and we experience the grief on this earth. But if we're followers of Jesus, we're just passing from this life into our eternity with him and nothing. Come on, angels can't step in and go, actually, I'm gonna separate you. Demons can't, hell of hell can't, nothing can separate us from the love of God, can I get a better amen? Come on, and then he goes on to say this, no power in the sky, and that's him probably talking about aliens at that point, I'm just teasing, I don't know. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, and he's like, just in case I missed anything, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. And where is that love of God found? That is revealed and found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, some of you are sitting here thinking, man, what does that word nothing really mean? Like surely, surely, surely there's gotta be something that could separate us from God's love. And it kind of got me thinking to try to explain this to you. Back in the day, there was a movie that I really enjoyed, and I'm going to kind of age myself and a few of you as well. And if you're a young person in the house, just ask your mom and dad to take you to Blockbuster on the way home today. You need to rent the movie The Three Amigos. Come on, raise your hand if you've seen The Three Amigos. Let's go. Uh, uh, uh. I'm not going to do it. I don't know. That was pretty good, though. Y'all remember that? I want us to watch this clip from The Three Amigos, and then we're gonna come back to this promise, and this is such a good clip. Come on, let's roll it. Look, boys, I know show business. Something always turns up. Telegram for The Three Amigos. Three Amigos, Hollywood, California. You are very great. 100,000 pesos to come to Santa Poco, put on show stop, the infamous El Guapo. What does that mean, infamous? Oh, <laughs> Dusty. <laughs> infamous is, is when you're more than famous. This man, El Guapo, is not just famous, he's infamous. 100,000 pesos to do a personal appearance with this guy, El Guapo, who is probably the biggest actor to ever come out of Mexico. Wow, the infamous? Infamous? I love this clip because they keep pronouncing the word infamous. The word is infamous. And it, they, they say it. he's not just famous, he's infamous. Like he's more than famous. That's not what it means. Infamous means evil and wicked. And so I need you to understand when we're talking about the love of God and that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Let's go back to Romans 8 one more time. He says, I am convinced that nothing, and I wanna break down what this word nothing really means so that you're not walking out of here going, nothing, this is what nothing means. No, here's what it means. Nothing, no thing, absolutely. Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. So don't leave this place going, well, actually, this thing can and that thing can. No, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have called upon him to come into your life, to forgive your sins, to wash you clean, make you new, he is in you and there is nothing that can separate you from his love. The Bible says this, Jesus says that, that, God, that we are put in God's hand and no one can snatch us out of his hands. This is who we are. This is where we are. This position is firmly established. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So I preached my first sermon when I was 18 years old and I preached it on these verses so every time I go to the book of Romans chapter eight, which is just an incredible chapter, you need to go and read it. It's full of just encouragement. It starts out that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And then it goes on to the liberation that we are, and we're free in Christ. And then it goes to the no separation, that the love of God can, nothing can separate us. It's an amazing chapter. When I was 18 years old, I preached my first ever sermon. It was actually at a local Baptist church near here. It was in an upstairs gymnasium that was just 
beyond repair. This thing was so busted and broken. There was no AC. There was seven teenagers there that night, and they were all sitting on one old wooden pew, like all of them. And I don't know if you, anybody knows anything about wooden pews, but they ain't the most comfortable thing. And they were all just standing there. And I, got, I had practiced that sermon over and over. It was probably going to be anywhere from about 10 to 15 minutes. How many of y'all know I was done in about three, man? Like I was like, I preached everything I had. But with that three minutes, man, I preached my guts out that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and here I am, 21 years later, just as passionate about this promise as ever before, probably even more passionate, because I'm telling you this, once you've received the love of God, that's one thing. The devil doesn't want you to receive God's love because he knows that'll change your life forever. But once you've received the love of God, now the devil's gonna kick it into high gear and he's gonna do everything he can to convince you that God's love, can, something can separate you from God's love or that God will stop loving you. And I'm just telling you, I have lived enough of my Christian life listening to his lies from time to time and I now stand on the truth of this promise. Man, there is nothing, not any lie that he says, not anything anybody can do, not anything I can do that can separate me from the love of God. And when you understand this promise, it will set you free. It's the words of Jesus, right? You'll know the truth. And the truth of these promises will set you free. And I just believe that somebody's in this place today and you have been wrestling. Does God love me? Does God, could God love me? Will he love me? Yes, there is nothing ever that can separate his love for you. But maybe, just maybe, you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You've never received the love of God in your life. Today is your day. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this place. I'm speaking to you through the power of technology this morning. God brought you here. You were worried about a preacher on a screen, but God's love is awakening you right now and calling out to your heart. This is what you have been missing your entire life. And if you're ready today to put your faith in Jesus, come on, let's go. Let's go. Just get honest with yourself, get honest with God, and come on, in your heart and in your mind right now, would you just pray a prayer? Not exactly what I'm saying, but something like what I'm saying. God, I need your love. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave your life for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me. I never thought I could be forgiven, but would you forgive me? Would you wash me clean? I want your love in my life. I want to follow after you. I want to pursue you. I'm tired of doing my own thing. I'm ready to surrender to you. Come on, if you're praying that prayer right now, the love of God is coming into your life. Come on, the love of God, Jesus is coming into your life and he is taking up residence in you. And guess what? You now have that love of God and nothing can separate you from that love. And I wanna celebrate with you in this morning. I know I'm not there in person, but I just wanna believe with you, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you just prayed that prayer, I'm gonna count to three and I'm just gonna ask you to shoot your hand in the air saying today I am giving my life to Jesus. Come on, one, two, three. Just put your hand in the air. Come on, shoot it bold. Shoot it bold. Come on, I'm believing that hands are up across the room right now. Thank you, Jesus, for what you are doing in people's lives. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. Church family, look at me right now. I'm believing that God has a plan for your life and that you're gonna walk out of these doors a little more confident with your chin up, not in your own strength. You're jumping on the back of your father. You're gonna catch that piggyback today and you're gonna go, I'm not walking in my love. I'm walking in his love. I'm not walking in my strength. I'm walking in his strength. I'm not walking on what I have. I am walking and standing on the promises of my God that my God is for me. Come on. Let's worship this morning. Let's lift our voices. I love you so much, Rise Church. Can't wait to see you next Sunday. Let's worship our God this morning.